concentrated poverty, war, refugees, rising sea levels, and pollution, all problems which are affecting cities the hardest. The magnification of challenges demonstrates the need for cities to find an actionable voice. Robert Mugga of the Igarape Institute will explore these challenges in a flash talk on mapping hotspots. Any of you having trouble sleeping at night? I know I am. I, I think these folks may be part of the problem. You know, reactionary nationalists and populists, they've got a couple things in common. For one, they've got a stubborn immunity to science, especially science of climate change on migration and security. They're also waging a full-scale assault on our cities, especially the underlying values of our cities, be it pluralism or cosmopolitanism or openness or tolerance. And maybe this isn't so surprising. After all, they're national politicians operating in the national interest. You know, if I'm honest, it's these nation states that really are contributing to my insomnia right now. We all tend to forget that we're in a 400-year-old experiment of political engineering. And despite what people say about the return of the nation state, I actually think they're approaching their expiry date. Look, they're not gonna go away anytime soon. But the reality is, is that they're unable and unwilling to deal with some of the biggest challenges that we're facing right now. And part of the problem is that they're weakening. They're weakening from above because of hyper-globalization, the deregulation of capital, the flow of people and ideas, but they're also weakening from below because of the rise of social networks, of new technologies, of global philanthropy, of NGOs, of cities. And this couldn't happen at a worse time. You see, the world has changed, but the basic units of our international affairs have not. And I think we'd be better off looking at the world through the lens of cities. What you have here is over 2,000 cities with a population of a quarter million people or more. And to make it really simple, the bigger and redder the circle, the more fragile that city over the last 15 years, and the smaller and the bluer, the more resilient. If you look at this map, I want you to consider the following details. In 1648, when nation states first genuinely burst on the scene, less than 1% of the world lived in a city. Today, it's over half. By 2050, it'll be over 70%. That's 2.5 billion people moving to cities. That's baked in, that's not gonna change. This is probably the most significant demographic shift in history. Tomorrow's hyper-urbanization isn't gonna be evenly distributed. Most of it's gonna be happening in this part of the world, in Africa and Asia. And this is gonna generate enormous opportunities and challenges. On the opportunity side, we're gonna see hundreds, if not thousands of cities being built literally from scratch. They're gonna be able to leapfrog old technologies, draw on distributed manufacturing, renewable energy, uh, smarter mobility solutions and the rest. And our big global cities, they're probably gonna urbanize, they're gonna densify, they're gonna become more vertical and green. But the reality is the vast majority of the world's cities, thousands of them, are not gonna be built with a future in mind. They're gonna struggle to, to, to attract global capital, uh, to talent and ideas. Uh, this is a really messy future that we're looking at. However, despite these challenges, I think cities are probably best placed to raise and to respond to some of our biggest challenges. Some cities are so economically powerful that they're rivaling nation states in power and influence. I've just realized this is the wrong presentation. <laughs> Let me go right here. They're gonna in power and influence. Uh, look at New York uh, and, and New Jersey and the, the, the Newark region. This huge urban conurbation has a nominal GDP of about $1.7 trillion. That's larger than Russia or Canada or South Korea. Brussels is on par with Kuwait and Hungary. Chicago is the same size in terms of its nominal GDP as Taiwan or Belgium. Now, these cities are economically powerful, but they're punching below their weight politically. And this is dangerous. Cities need to be able to exert their urban sovereignty. This is because they're facing mega existential risks, and they're gonna need all the political power they can muster to deal with them. I wanna spend time talking about nine of the big risks we're gonna be facing over the next three days. I'm gonna do that using this, Earth Time, which is a platform developed by Carnegie Mellon University and my institute and many others. So let me get right to it. Risk number one, 
urban poverty and inequality. Although we've made incredible strides in dealing with global poverty around the world, it's still a major challenge in cities. Poverty is urbanizing precisely because the world is urbanizing, especially in Africa and Asia. But the scale of urban poverty is still pretty invisible because we're still relying on these kinds of data sets at the national scale. Concentrated poverty and inequality isn't just a problem, though, for the global south. It's a big challenge right here in North America and Western Europe. Uh, and it amplifies every other problem in cities, whether it's crime or access to affordable housing or whether it's uh, public services or economic development. It's also intergenerational. You know, children growing up in poor neighborhoods have permanently reduced life prospects. Let's take a look at Chicago. Chicago has an, an historically low unemployment rate right now of around 3.8 to 4%, but it hovers around 9% for African Americans. This is census data from 2012 to 2016 showing clusters of poverty by different groups. The reality is one in three African Americans living in Chicago are living in poverty. And this is due to a legacy of segregation, but also to deindustrialization. Let's go to crime, risk number two. Crime is a problem for every city around the world. What you have here is national data on homicide rates, as well as data for the most violent cities around the planet over the last 20 years. Now, the good news is, is that crimes actually come down, violent crime across North America and Western Europe by significant amounts in the last two decades. But there are still some hot spots, notably Latin America and Southern Africa. Right now, Latin America has 9% of the world's population and almost 40% of its homicides. It has 46 of the 50 most violent cities on the planet, including 17 in the country where I live in, Brazil. And this has a lot to do with concentrated poverty, inequality, and the other issues I mentioned. War, risk number three. Armed conflicts are also widespread and becoming more internationalized. The red dots here represent individual fatalities or clusters of fatalities. There are about 50 armed conflicts ongoing right now. The big issue, though, is that armed conflicts are migrating to cities. And this is the number one concern right now for many militaries, relief agencies, uh, and development organizations around the world. Terrorism. Like crime and conflict, it's also unevenly distributed. Each of these clusters represents, again, groups of fatalities generated from incident reports. Now, they're both foreign and homegrown forms of terrorism, but we've seen a sharp increase since 2001, and especially since the Iraq intervention in 2003. But two big points. 90% of all terrorist fatalities in the last five years took place in less than 12 countries, including countries like Iraq and Syria, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Just 5% of all incidents took place in Europe. Less than 1% took place in, in the United States. That's not to say that we shouldn't be vigilant, but it's to put the issue into perspective. There is a real role for cities when it comes to de-radicalization and addressing extremism head on. Now with conflict, crime, and terrorism, you have refugees, lots of refugees. Uh, what you're gonna see in a moment is a dot, each dot, which represents a single refugee. There are more than 25 million around the world right now. We're at, uh, we haven't seen this level since the Second World War, and there's 36 million people who are internally displaced. And the big issue right now in the last 20 years is that they're moving to cities. The majority of refugees are moving to cities as opposed to being warehoused in camps or living in rural areas. But here's the punchline. 90% of them are staying close to home. Just 10% are making it to Western cities in the North. But even a small number can generate enormous ramifications. Rising temperatures is risk number six. The last decade has been the hottest on record. And the burning of fossil fuels, as all of you know, is the chief culprit. What you see here is forest fires, uh, industrial emissions and gas flares from satellites uh, at night. And these warming temperatures are contributing to water shortages, to heat island effects, to biodiversity loss, uh, as well as drought. It's also leading to massive levels of ambient air pollution. The World Health Organization estimated last year that about 7 million people died prematurely as a result of ambient air pollution. Uh, this is 10 times more the number of people who died as a result of violence of all causes. This is a chronic problem in cities in Beijing or in Delhi, but it's also a big issue here, as all of you know, in North America. In California last year, there were 9,000 forest fires, consumed about 2 million acres of land. Uh, as a result, cities like Stockton, Sacramento, and San Francisco were the most polluted cities on the planet for a couple of weeks. Rising seas is risk number seven. The ice caps and sea levels, are, ice caps are melting and sea levels are rising because of this warming temperature. And cities are on the front line. Why? Because two thirds of them are coastal. 
We're talking, according to the World Bank, of up to 140 million people being displaced as a result of rising sea levels by the middle of this century. What you see here is predicted land loss, depending on changes in temperatures between zero and four degrees. Shanghai, a mega city of 24 million people, goes underwater at two degrees Celsius. And this isn't just a problem for Asian cities or African cities or Pacific Island cities, and it is. It's a huge issue here in the States and all across the Americas, on the east and the west coast. Here's San Francisco. Uh, San Francisco, the entire Bay Area, loses about 400 square kilometers at about two degrees Celsius, with about half a million people affected, uh, and untold costs in terms of infrastructure. Risk number eight, pandemics. Climate change and globalization are generating new forms of public health hazards. What you see here is a spread of two viruses, not the most dangerous ones, but dengue and Zika over the last decade. Now, these viruses don't move linearly. They move exponentially. And the speed at which they're moving right now is accelerating, especially between our cities. The potential for catastrophic pandemic outbreaks is at the highest level that WHO has ever recorded. And cities have an enormously important role to play in addressing that. And it's not just public health types of risks. It's also digital viruses we need to worry about. And this is risk nine, my last risk. What you see here is heart bleed. Some of you may remember Heartbleed first appeared in 2014. Actually, it started in 2012, but we only discovered it in 2014. It affected 70, an estimated 70% of the internet. More than 600 million sites were affected by this one particular virus. So the rise of IoT, the, the move towards 5G, and the digitization of our cities, our smart cities, are a nightmare from a security perspective. Why? Because the internet, as all of you know, was not built with security in mind. And we're already seeing how viruses and hacking are affecting our cities. Just think of the Ukraine power grid in 2015, or think about the way in which our transport hubs are being hijacked in parts of the United States. So, I'm sorry for all the doom and gloom. <laughs> I did tell you I was having trouble sleeping at night. But here's my punchline. Cities are key to solving and resolving and addressing some of these big global risks. And the good news is, is that they're already taking action around the world. But the problem is they can't deal with these challenges on their own. Cities are not islands. And while they may need to work with nation states, they can't rely on nation states to get the job done. So let me close with two big priorities which will be discussed over the coming days. First, cities need to ramp up their soft power through diplomacy. If you think about it, cities are the originators of foreign policy. Just go back to Chinese or Greek or Roman city-states or the Hanseatic League in Northern Europe. Today, most global cities have some kind of diplomatic core engaging in economic or cultural or scientific or educational exchange. Cities are already influencing global agendas in a big way. Just think of the Paris Climate Agreement, where hundreds of cities push nation states to take bolder targets. Or think of the compacts on migration and refugees, where cities played an active role. Or even on conventions to prohibit nuclear weapons, we have cities banding together, trying to push for stricter constraints. This is no longer an optional extra, this is an essential. My second point is that cities need to collaborate in international networks. You know, cities can leverage their urban sovereignty by working in international and national coalitions. They can pool resources, amplify their voices, and scale up standards around the world. Right now, there are more than 300 intercity networks, at least 100 of which are international or global in focus. There are more intercity networks than there are nation state networks. Think of on issues of global governance. We have the UCLG. Metropole, uh, the U20, the Global Parliament of Mayors. On issues of climate, we have the C40, we have ICLEI and dozens of others. On security, we have APHIS, IFA, Strong Cities, UN Habitat, and more. Cities can bridge the local and the global. They are global, in the words of the late Ben Barber. They can be an antidote to this reactionary nationalism and populism that we're seeing. And at a time when our nations are in retreat, and our international and multilateral institutions are paralyzed, cities and mayors are stepping up. They're taking action and they're influencing. Look, mayors and cities are not going to solve all our problems, but if we can empower them just a little bit, maybe we'll all sleep a bit better at night. Thank you.